Hello everyone, this is Zeroes Trivia, and welcome back to our Hanjun campaign series as we continue with episode 3, titled Supply Issues. Now last time we ended at Xia Yuan's death, but Cao Cao's western forces on the back foot, with Zhang He forced to take over as the interim commander, while Guo Huai delayed Liu Bei's assault by aggressively posturing with his troops on the north bank of the Han River to give off the appearance of strength. And time is exactly what they needed, as Cao Cao and his main force was already on their way. By March of 219, Cao Cao's forces had arrived in Chang'an and immediately received the bad news regarding Xia Huoyuan's passing. In response, Cao Cao chose to take the Baoxie path this time straight into Hanzhong instead of looping all the way towards Mount Qi like he did on his previous campaign and it will only take his army roughly a month to finish the 250 kilometer march as Cao Cao would regroup with his main forces at Yangping Gate around late April in 219. And spotting Cao Cao's arrival, Liu Bei would quickly retreat his forward forces back to Mount Dingjun. At the same time, Zhao Yun and Huang Zhong were ordered to push their forces even farther east along the south bank of the Han River to garrison at a city called Gu. This position was especially important as their unit can now overlook the Han River at the shallow bend and can raid Cao Cao's supply line coming in from the Chang'an region. Now like I mentioned before, rivers have always played an important role as supply lines throughout history as it requires far less troops to transport the same amount of supplies when traveling alongside a river, since the food and supplies can now be placed on rafts and floated alongside the transport unit. This not only reduces the number of laborers required to assist with the logistic of supply transportation for the army, but also, most importantly, reduces the natural consumption of food and supplies by the transport unit itself. According to Han records in regards to wars in the Xidan area, for every one grain of wheat that you wanted to transport to the Liang province from the central plain, the transport team itself would need to consume 19 grains. So this means less than 5% of the total food supplies you send will end up in the stomach of the frontline troops, assuming you have to rely on land transport. This ratio, of course, changes drastically when transporting on rivers, as you can have the same number of unit that was pushing supply carts one by one, now guiding a string of 20 or 30 rafts filled with the same supplies, which greatly improves the efficiency of the supply transports. And this is exactly why cities like Hefei, which guards the key riverways, became such hot spots during the Three Kingdom period. Likewise, Zhao Yun and Huang Zhong's position now threatened to cut off Cao Cao's supply line along the Han River. Meanwhile, Cao Cao, who had just arrived, did not have intel on Zhao Yun and Huang Zhong's position. He only knew of Liu Bei's position at Mount Dingjun, which was a big enough headache already, as he would soon realize the same predicament that resulted in Xia Huoyuan's death. For even though they held Yangping Gate and controlled the north bank of the Han River, Liu Bei's position at Mount Dingjun offered the perfect vantage point to observe the north bank, allowing him to pick and choose his raiding targets. So Cao Cao ended up taking a very similar approach as Xia Yuan, as he would lead his main force south to form a surround on Mount Dingjun to trap Liu Bei there, while the remaining forces would assault Chen Shi and Gao Xiang's position west of Yangping Gate in order to cut off Liu Bei's supply line through the mountains, thus effectively trapping Liu Bei's army at Mount Dingjun. And with much more manpower at his disposal than Xia Yuan, Cao Cao was able to form the blockade around Mount Dingjun without running into the same issues that Xia Yuan and Zhang He did, as his army was able to provide ample cover fire in terms of arrows to buy time and safety for his men to construct the palisades needed to seal off Liu Bei's forces atop the mountain. Now this ring of arrows got so bad that Fa Zheng had to physically pull Liu Bei back from his command post 
as the risk of Liu Bei taking a straight arrow was becoming all too apparent, as they retreated farther up the mountain. But despite Cao Cao's success here at Mount Dingjun, the Cao outside of Yangping Gate grinded to a halt. Unlike the open plain surrounding Mount Dingjun, the narrow mountain passes and the Han River restricted the space available for armies to operate. So despite their massive numbers advantage, it never became a factor here, as Gao Xiang's forces did take heavy casualties, but the supply line to Liu Bei held. And speaking of supply lines, both sides started to struggle with labor shortages. First, on Cao Cao's side, the main issue was not that he had brought over 100,000 troops to reinforce the Hanzhong region, as Cao Cao had fielded a similar sized army during his previous Hanzhong campaign against Zhang Lu. The main issue here is that while Cao Cao was conducting his military campaign against Liu Bei, he was also in the process of evacuating all the civilians living in the Liang province and the western parts of Hanzhong. And this was all happening even before Xia Huyuan's death, as the forced migration of newly conquered territory was always part of Cao Cao's strategy to strengthen his position while also weakening his opponents. If we look back at Cao Cao's policies in regards to Xu and Jin province's land bordering Sun Quan's territory, we can see that he took a very similar approach in terms of forcing the local populace to migrate north. This type of move helped strengthen the Tuntian farm system put in place by Cao Cao, as the food production and conscription of troops were both aided by the influx of new population to areas firmly under Cao Cao's control, while at the same time eliminated the ability for enemies to scavenge for food and supplies during evasions, as the border area simply became no man's land with no farmland left for the enemy to loot from. And acknowledging Liu Bei's growing threat from the Yi province, Cao Cao wanted to implement the same tactic in the neighboring Hanzhong region and the Liang province to the north. So, as Cao Cao's army marched into the Hanzhong region, over 300,000 civilians were in the process of being uprooted throughout the Liang province as they were being shepherded through these dangerous mountain passes to resettle in the central plains. Of course, almost no one wanted to leave their homes, but with soldiers forcing them to resettle, the people had no choice. Of course, Cao Cao is not crew enough to not provide logistical support for these migrants, as he's now forced to provide them with food along the way. Now to be clear, Cao Cao had more than enough food, but he lacked laborers to transport them, as he already conscripted a large amount of the available manual labor from the nearby provinces to help support the logistical need for his army. So now in order to facilitate over 300,000 migrants, he started to conscript laborers from even far away provinces, as this would end up putting an enormous economic strain on the Han Empire at this time, as every laborer who headed west was one less who stayed home to farm and support their families and the state. Then to compound the problem, after arriving in Hanzhong, Cao Cao immediately ordered the 80,000 civilians living in the north bank of the western Hanzhong region to start migrating to Chang'an on the same Baoxie path that his army had just marched through. Now this by itself would not be a huge issue if Cao Cao ended up beating Liu Bei in Hanzhong, but if he lost, the massive disaster could be on his hand, as retreating out of Hanzhong is now going to be much harder than marching into it, especially with mountain paths now congested with slow-moving civilian caravans and the enemy in hot pursuit. But before we get ahead of ourselves, the supply issue for Liu Bei was not any easier. Not only was his supply line coming under constant attack by Cao Zhen and Xu Huang's forces stationed at Yangping Gate, the supply line itself was difficult to maintain even in peaceful times, as Liu Bei had to rely on food being transported all the way from Chengdu. So all along the 750 kilometer supply line is the difficult mountainous path that is the Jinyu path. Then once the supply safely sails up the White River and arrives at the west of Yangping Gate, Gao Xiang and Chen Shi also had to divert a large amount of manpower to climb over multiple mountains with the food 
to reach Liu Bei's camp at Mount Dingjun. And since Cao Cao had blockaded pretty much the entire north side of the mountain, these supply transport teams now have to loop around the more difficult mountainous terrains to deliver the supplies to Liu Bei from the south side of the mountain. Since all this required manual labor, and we have already discussed the natural consumption of food by such transport teams that cannot rely on rivers, Liu Bei not only had to gather much more supplies in Chengdu than normally needed, but he also needed a lot more laborer to carry them. And this task naturally fell to Zhuge Liang, who had been handling all the administrative duties in Liu Bei's absence. And with the help from official Yang Hong, who expressed the willingness to commit the entirety of the Shu land to aid Liu Bei by having all the capable men and women to assist with supply transport, Zhuge Liang was able to bring enough supplies to Liu Bei's forces. And since Fa Zheng, who was the administrator of the Shu commandery, was away on the front lines, Zhuge Liang even promoted Yang Hong to replace Fa Zheng for the time being to give him the jurisdiction needed to push forward the policies to conscript the necessary laborers and gather the needed supplies. So now with both sides struggling to move these supplies, the turning point of the Hanzhong campaign would come when Zhao Yun and Huang Zhong's advance force at the city of Gu finally made their move at Cao Cao's supply line on the Han River. Of course, such a vital position was well defended. So when Huang Zhong volunteered himself to lead this attack, Zhao Yun was quite concerned about whether their small vanguard force would have enough manpower to take on the enemy. In the end, Zhao Yun gave Huang Zhong strict orders to return by a certain time limit, as he himself would be forced to remain at their encampment to defend their position. However, when the time would arrive, Huang Zhong did not return. Worried about his safety, Zhao Yun would leave the camp in Zhang Yi's hand, as he would take 10 riders with him to look for Huang Zhong. Yet before he could locate Huang Zhong, Zhao Yun's party would instead bump into a large group of enemy reinforcements. Too late to hide, Zhao Yun ordered his small scouting party to give charge, as he would lead them on multiple charges in an attempt to break the enemy formation, as they also slowly retreated back towards their own camp. And once Zhao Yun made it back to camp, he would order Zhang Yi to silence all the war drums and keep all the gates open to give off the appearance of an ambush, while he would turn around to charge right back into the enemy forces as his lieutenant, Zhang Zhu, was still injured and trapped amongst the enemy forces. And after a short fight, Zhao Yun, who has not lost a step since his Changban days, managed to drag Zhang Zhu out of the enemy encirclement as they fought their way back to the safety of their own camp. Now seeing the enemy camp with the gates ajar, Cao Cao's forces start to back off as they now fear that an ambush awaited them. And sure enough, with a wave of Zhao Yun's spear, the war drums roared and the arrows rained down from the previously silent camp as Zhao Yun once again charged back towards Cao Cao's force, except this time he was not charging alone, as the rest of the Shu Han forces followed his lead. Turning tail to run, Cao Cao's supply unit would suffer heavy losses, as many would drown in the Han River as they would stampede over each other, trying to ferry themselves back to the north bank. And now knowing that their encampment would be safe, Zhao Yun would lead the entire force to reinforce Huang Zhong, who was still stuck in a bitter long fight at the enemy supply depot. But with the arrival of Zhao Yun's army, the tide would turn, and before long, Cao Cao's supplies would go up in flames. And with this, we're going to end our episode here, as we'll come back next time to wrap up our Hanzhong series. As with Cao Cao's supply depot now burned down to the ground, his main forces at Yangping Gate is officially on the clock, as their existing supplies could only last them two month tops. So hopefully you all enjoy this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!